Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name's John Kelly. Uh, I'm, I've been someone who's been writing for the Comics Journal for a long time, and I also do a new publication called Dummy, and I'm thrilled to be here and with a bunch of incredibly talented, very diverse, style-wise uh, cartoonists, and we're going to talk to them about the, um, the styles that they use to tell their stories. And um, this is so funny because the order that I wrote down Randomly, um, the list is exactly how you guys are sitting. So um, we'll just from left. Um, we have um, we have Benji Nate, um, whose uh, most recent publication is yes, <laughs> really really funny. Most recent publication is Girl Juice, um, published by Silver Sprocket. And um, we were just in San Francisco about two weeks ago and went to that store. It was such a cool place. It's just. So exciting to see that there's all of this um, uh, comic energy going on in all, all over the country. And, um, and then next um, is um, Sophie Yano. And um, um, her most recent book is the Eisner Award winning The um, Contradiction. And um, next after that is we, uh, Carolyn Cash, who's um, the Eisner, um, Eisner um, winning, I'm waiting all day to be able to say this, Eisner Award winning Pee Pee Poo Poo, um, <laughs> just, just such a fresh, um, um, exciting um, voice to, to have, have um, on comics, just like, just, just so exciting. And, and Carolyn also, as many of you know probably, um, has been doing the, um, the Nancy Daly comic strip for Olivia James while she was on break for a while. She did an amazing job with that. So we're so, so thrilled to have her. And um, then we have um, uh, Josh Beyer, who um, is Ignatz Award, very personal new graphic novel is um, um, unended. And um, good luck tonight. Thank you. With, with that. So now, um, I think let's let's start with um, looking at your most recent works, and if we can, this is going to be just like randomly looping, um, a, like a sampling of, of each of your your stuff. Um, it's too bad it's behind your head, <laughs> but don't don't try not to worry about that. But um, for each of your most recent um, pieces that you've uh, done, can you talk? Two things. Um, what tools were you using to create this work? And then, for all of you, you have, you have, you have varying drawing styles over the years. You know, why were you specifically using that? And for some of you, you use, a very, you use various types of styles within the same publication. But um, what about that style? Try to pick one, I guess. Um, let you tell the story that you're telling or stories um, in, in the way that you wanted to tell. Now, how did that help? So, um, um, I, Caroline, maybe just like start with you and with your Nancy work, and we can talk about whatever you want to talk about, but with, with Nancy, I think it's your Nancy strips were containing all of the classical Nancy elements, right? But if you look at them, they're like, they were definitely you, right? It has your humor, your drawing style. So it was such a great way to synthesize um, something that's a really hard to draw, too. It's, it's a very difficult strip, and you did a great job um, putting it in, together. So um, some other people would have tried to mimic um, one of the previous um, Cartoonists like you know, I don't know if anyone can mimic Bushmiller, but um, people have tried over the years. But you, you can talk about that, or if you can talk about um, the, the newest issue of Pee Pee Poo Poo too. Or yeah, both. totally. Um, I think Ivan Brunetti did the best job in imitating Ernie Bushmiller for sure. Um, if you've ever seen any of his Nancy strips, but sure. uh, yeah, I mean, I, I draw all of my comics with with a G nib. That's the thing that makes the most sense to me. It's the tool that, and I've tried as many nibs as possible, 
different markers and different pins and it's just it's the thing that makes the most sense to my hand um, and it's just a really flexible nib that I like a lot um, and when I was working on Nancy I used a G-nib um, and I you know uh, drawed it and I, I, tr I tried to to draw it in a way that was like evocative of the classics that I like so much and of Olivia's strip that I also really love um, while still, you know, since getting to do guests on like a legacy comic strip doesn't always happen. So I wanted to still be able to kind of like freak it a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and luckily like Olivia and the editors were really kind and supportive for me being able to do that. Um, Did you have to um, run by your, like at what point, like I'm sure they, they were vetting your stuff to a certain degree, but like were, were they giving you thumbs up, thumbs down? Like were they getting final approval or were you able to sort of do what you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I would send the pencils for each strip to Olivia and uh, our editor Ryan um, and then they would give feedback and then I would send inks and then they would also give feedback for that so there was like a two-part editorial process um, it was my first time drawing an all-ages strip or like an all-ages comic in general so there's a little bit of like that and then like what even like what newspaper formatting is like because yeah. like it's very specific what um, the actual panel sizes and stuff. So it was, they were great editors. They gave really yeah. good feedback. There was a couple of times where I was like, I think that there's a joke here and I want to like make it even funnier. And Olivia was able to give just immediately, same day, 20 minutes later, email back like, oh, just switch their expressions. And it's like, that's it. <laughs> You're so good at this. Um, so yeah, it was great. Cool. Um, Sophie, I was, I was wondering with the contradictions, um, your, your style there is, is tighter than it is in some of your earlier work, right? Which um, is almost, I think all of this makes perfect sense, right? It's like, I was gonna say, I, was, I wrote down like architectural mm. um, with, with some of your early stuff because there's so much spatial and there's chaos. There's like you know spontaneity with with your drawing style, and that. Um, but you, you you know everyone changes as they keep doing things. But uh, I'm gonna stop um, talking. But there's, uh, there's also like European, and which makes total sense based on what the story, where it's taking place and everything. But um, what about your style changed? that made you able to tell your story the way that you wanted to in there? Yeah, so the contradictions. Sorry, long, long question. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's a lot of good points to kind of make. Like, so the, the Contradictions is a book that is partially like an, a, a hitchhiking story in like Western Europe and France and Belgium and stuff. So I wanted to show the physical spaces that the characters actually like arrive at. And the style that I had been drawing in previously, I just didn't feel like I could quite, like I felt like I needed to solidify things and like crystallize things like a little bit more to actually get, you know, there's plenty of white space. <laughs> like I'm still me, I can't help it, but <laughs> there's like a lot more just sort of like, okay, like I'm drawing a location. So we get at least a little feeling of like, of that place. Um, and then also like it's definitely visually aesthetically influenced by the like Franco-Belgian cartooning style, clear line style. And my previous work, like there's definitely elements of that, but I think like because this book is partially taking place in France and Belgium, it just like something in my brain was like, okay, let's lean into that a little bit for this. So, and I also, yeah, I drew it with, with microns, light boxing, um, and a lot of rulers. And yeah. my previous like uh, Box Brown who published ret the, um, what is a glacier with retrofit? When he saw the pages as I was serializing them online, he was like, oh, you're drawing digitally now, cool. And I was mm -hmm. like, no, I'm using a lot of rulers because yeah, really. I like my brain is weird, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Bushmiller used a lot of rulers. Mm. Um, they come in handy. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, so one thing is, it, so the book has been described as both 
autobiography, but also a fictional. So if you want to clarify, I mean, you don't have to, but I'm just curious for my own. Yeah. Is this sort of based on true? Yeah, I mean, I call it autofiction or autobiographical fiction. Those two words, phrases actually like mean kind of different things, but it, I, I wanted, my previous work has a lot of narration and part of that, and it's, it's really straight memoir. I mean, unless, I also do non, like straight nonfiction that's about topics, but all of that is very narr narration heavy. And I wanted to make something that was much more like a story that you're kind of experiencing with the characters. And in order to do that, I started to change things because I was like, uh, well, to make this moment work, like I need a scene that's gonna actually like set this up. And so I started inventing scenes. And then as I did that, I was like, okay, this is getting you know, more and more fictional. So it is like the character is named Sophie and it's very much based on things that happened in my life, but it's other characters are amalgams and things that happened didn't necessarily happen in the order in which they happened or or in the, the place in which, you know, these conversations are taking place. Did you place. actually hitchhike? Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I was, yeah, I was in Europe probably around that same age, um, and I'm really glad I didn't hitchhike. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, it was like, it was mostly fun. I, I'm sure. <laughs> it's fun until you die, right? It's like... <laughs> Um, Benji, I, you, you, so I, I do feel like yeah. hitchhiking in Europe is more chill than hitchhiking in America. Like, I, I mean, I've know. also done. It, it depends here, what part of America you're in. Just yeah, think yeah, about oh what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Like, <laughs> totally. Would you feel sick? I mean, I'm not gonna. Okay. <laughs> um, so Benji, your um, girl's juices is, is is like it, it's so bright and vibrant and colorful and really funny and um, it's just like it jumps off the page with 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 the um, with the lines and the, and, and the color and it's just like can you talk a little bit how um, that approach works or if it does in your mind like how I mean you're using it so um, how does how does it um, help what you're trying to tell the story well I think it helps um I was doing them for Instagram for a long time. Right. So, so they were, these were original digital. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I drew them. I drew them traditionally. I draw with. Um, I find that fascinating too. Yeah. You draw yeah. with two types of pens, like a thin one and a, th a thicker. Yes. And yeah. Faber Castell's point five yeah. and point three. Yeah. That's an old school. Is it? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's. Mm -hmm. it, I just. I am faster with traditional media. Uh, I also used a leader paper, which is really smooth, so the pen just kind of like glides over it real fast. I'm kind of a speed demon, kind of everything I do is for the purpose of speed, because for a while I was posting them like almost daily, and I was just releasing them as they were finished. So yeah, it's just, it's all about how fast I can get it out. It's also, I think there's this like experience that pretty much anybody who has ever posted a drawing online has experienced where like a doodle they do becomes the most successful thing that they post online versus like a finished rendered piece. So yeah. I, d I try to like capture that with everything I do, just like this, the spontaneity right, of it, right. yeah. So, and, then, and Josh, so with, with Unended, like you're, there's, there's chaos, there's all of these colors, there's vibrancy, there's you know turmoil, in there, and I think all of that, and you're using so many different types of um, tools. I, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm looking at it. It looks like you're using paint, you're using, um, you know, pen. You're you're using a lot of different types of things, and I think that that mishmash of everything captures the story that you're telling, which is you know just like confusion, right? Mm -hmm. And um, trying to piece things together that are not so easily understandable, so. You like the book, right? What's that? <laughs> you, like, you like the book, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, is that, was that, that sound negative? I'm just kidding, I'm just, I, no, it's all accurate. <laughs> I, yeah. It just depends how somebody puts a spin on those words. Oh, oh yeah, I know. Um, I used to spin for a living, but um, yeah, I, I, I get it. Um, I did, I've had, no, I'm not gonna get into it. I've had weird jobs in the past, um, but um, me too. What? Me too. Yeah, but no. But I, but I think it, it w your like splatter shot approach in a, in a way, you know, captures the 
for my all of the you know confusion of the story that you're telling, and I think it totally works. But um, was that what you're attempting to do? All of your work is often has a lot of those elements in it anyway. So yeah, I'm kind of helpless for the work kind of not to look like the way that it does, and it's. Um, uh, I was telling somebody today they were asking about how uh, Lemmy from Motorhead is like starring in Star Trek in my comic. And I said to them, well, Star Lemmy in Star Trek is like the comic that I want to do, and Unended is a comic that I have to do. And he was like, yeah, yeah, in your previous book you had Wendy Williams. I'm like, yeah, I want to do a comic about Wendy Williams. But I, um, I, yeah, I'm kind of a very, uh, uh, a conflicted person, and like I, my sensibilities are often really warring with each other. And uh, I'll make, I definitely make a lot of decisions when I'm working, and but then I'll make another decision, and uh, I'm not even aware of it. And I'll have like five different, like some artists work within, within um, self-imposed constrictions, and love that idea. And then that doesn't mean I can always execute that really well. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm always so I'm very experimental, and uh, the because I'm a very like my ADD ends up like leading the you know setting the pace a lot. Okay. Yeah, I wanted a question that I have. If we get, you know, we'll see how this goes. I have a I have a question about process mm -hmm. um, that I wanted to ask all of you, but um, but but for first let's just jump to. Um, Influences, I guess, which is sort of a, I mean, Benji, I, I listened to a interview with you where you were talking about that you kind of started drawing um, um, Sailor Moon, like you're sketching yeah. or tracing Sailor Moon, and I can totally see mm -hmm. how that, you know, because it's it's I, to me it's still in your in your in your work, and in but for everybody, is there any Artist, it doesn't have to be a, a comic artist, right? Is there any artist that, when you were just starting out, maybe, um, who inspired you in a way that maybe is still lingering in your work, or help you know, helping inform your work today? Like how about how far back are we talking here? To so, like before you were born. No. <laughs> no, no, not before you were born, but like since you were born. Like, are you talking childhood influence, or more like when you started making? It's a broad question. You can okay. you can interpret it however you want. If if it works for you that it, when you were two days ago, <laughs> um, if that works for your answer, then that's good too. Cool. But I was thinking as, as a kid, right? You know, before you were like, oh, I just like to draw, right? I like, to, I like comics, I just like to do this. It's just like, who did you like at that time that maybe is still there? I was, I was really hyper fixated on Pokemon and drawing every single Pokemon <laughs> and getting okay. to draw them in a way where they looked perfect and also drawing myself as Ash Ketchum as much as possible. <laughs> and I, I really think drawing Pokemon helped me learn how to draw, like, better. <laughs> so was Pokemon like your introduction to manga? Um, I think uh, my the first manga I ever read was either One Piece or Rave Master. Um, and I, both are great. Um, <laughs> Both are huge influences. One is a slapstick gag comedy about pirates, and the other is about a guy who has a giant sword that can turn into different swords. So sick. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, I just read the new chapter of One Piece like yesterday. It's really okay. good. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the pacing and like the the early comics that I was really into as like a seven year old is still something I think about for the pacing of current stuff. Okay. What about you guys? Um, as a little kid, the things that I made the most like comics 
fanfic of were Sonic the Hedgehog comics, which <laughs> so, I don't know, <laughs> um, and then uh, like Calvin and Hobbes. And, and I think the Calvin and Hobbes stuff, I mean, I do, it's funny, like these days I am drawing some more like, I feel like, you know, the, the age that I am there was really, uh, I don't know, people did not encourage you to draw in like a manga sort of, or like Japanese influenced style. Um, but I think that as far as like the Calvin and Hobbes stuff, I do think the like sort of intellectualism, the like comedic intellectualism of Bill Watterson has like always been really appealing and I think sort of trickles into my work. And also I think having, being so into like a strip where also, you know, he would make these just lush backgrounds, but then also drop the backgrounds out and, you know, realizing you can get away with that, I, I feel like that still kind of influences me. Yeah. 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 When you do it and you do it, like you drop a little bit of the background and it looks better and it feels so good. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, oh. you're... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, mine was already answered for me, so I'm <laughs> well, good. Well, right, okay, but you can, you can expand upon that, right? Yeah, um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> or, or not. It's up to you. Yeah, no, when I was little, my mom used to pause the TV, and we used to draw with dry erase markers on the TV, whatever we paused on. It was, it was really cute. Yeah, we would do that with, like, Disney movies, and I didn't, that didn't really show up in my influences at all, but the Sailor Moon definitely, I think, yeah. did. Yeah. I had Winky Dink as a kid, which you may not know what that is, but I drew on the TV set with actual magic markers um, and got in trouble for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I, yeah, I still like cycle through. A lot. I still cycle through a lot of my influences uh, constantly and talk about them all the time. When I start teaching a class, I say on the first day, like, we're talking about Harold Gray again, and I'm going to talk about him a lot. And uh, Petty Bone and Jack Kirby, and then I surprised myself. Like I, the more um, doing research, usually for students, um, the more I'll find somebody that I have a new appreciation for, who is stuff I've never looked at carefully. Um, sometimes uh, I just like the way people do backgrounds, and I don't like anything else about their work. Or, uh, and I'll get very heavily into somebody I've looked at a million times. Yeah. But then when you look at them with the purpose of like doing a studying them to you know try to um, try to uh, uh, match what they do, you get a whole different understanding of it. So most recently, it's been Edward Gorey. Probably couldn't think of somebody who like on the surface looks less different than my stuff. But um, uh, yeah, I'm I am uh, always looking at history. Yeah, I, I find that as a teacher. Um, you, it's good to really listen to like what the students are into. Like at one of the schools I'm at, they, I teach a comics course and they were like, well, teach comics, but don't teach them um, anime. Don't teach them superheroes. And I'm like, do you, do you mean manga? And they, uh, and, and I push back, I've pushed back on this with a couple of different programs. I'm like, you know, you, if I say to students, um, one of the students brings up Chainsaw Man, is that it? Yeah. Everybody in the room will nod like they are now. I'm like, that's a sea change. I don't. I still kind of don't know what Chainsaw Man is. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't nod. So the students will get excited and start talking to each other about Chainsaw Man. I'm like, you know, what are we supposed to ignore that? It's like, as a teacher, if you don't like what's going on with manga, because some of the other teachers say, oh, it just teaches the students to have this very, con uh, they see it as a conformist style because they're conforming to the to the uh, methods or whatever, I'm like, then encourage the students to turn it inside out and invert it and build upon it. Cool. Influences. I think you should read Chainsaw Man. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you should read Fire Punch, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Making a note. This is the one he did before. Fire Punch. It's crazy. This is like on a somewhat related topic, though. Is there like, can you pinpoint? Um, some piece of art, it, again, doesn't have to be comics, but um, that you saw that was your like aha moment, like where like, ah, now I get it. Like now I'm, I, I wanna be a cartoonist. It's, you know, that's the thing that made me wanna do it. I, I mean, I can think of my, 
certain things I've read when I was younger that, that was like, oh, I want to be, you know, whatever. But go ahead. You, They're Je fighting. you know, uh, Jeffrey Brown's here to, at this festival, and I'm really, I get really thrilled every time I see him. And I remember, you know, I get, got into comics after a big lull when I was in my 30s. And partly, Jeffrey Brown's probably 10 years younger than me. And I remember seeing his stuff, and I'm like, uh, I always tell people this story. Like, one of the things that kind of got me off track was reading 90s comics journals where I'd read essays where they were like, stop doing autobio before you've lived and have anything interesting to say. And stop doing superhero comics and then pretending you're not doing superhero comics because you've made them like satirical. And, and then I was like, oh fuck, I can't do those things. So I guess I gotta, <laughs> I gotta like, to be, or I'm not authentic and I'll have to figure out some other way to be cool. And then I saw this guy who hadn't read those articles. And so he was, that was a turning point for me when I saw that people were doing what I wanted to do and I had to catch up with, with them. And also, on Jeffrey Brown's case, I saw his work at a festival, maybe at SPX, and I could see on his originals that he didn't really do any um, penciling. He did, like, ghost pencils. And then I asked him, I'm like, this stuff looks very, how do you do it? And he's so super articulate, but he, like, kind of hemmed and hawed and tried to answer and, like, really authentically could not explain how he's able to kind of do this feat of improvising it all in ink. Jeffrey was my professor in college. What? Yeah, <laughs> I was super lucky. He's such a sweet guy. Chicago, right? Yeah, in Chicago at SAIC. Um, I, what, a, a major thing that got me into comics was um, I met my friend Gabe Howell, who's a really incredible cartoonist, um, and we were in like the same like gay literature class or something for a freshman. But um, we were talking, and I was like, oh, like I like. I like comics too. That's so <laughs> sick that you make comics. And he he went to SAIC specifically because he was so impacted by reading Jeffrey's work when he was in high school that he was like, oh, I'll just go to the college that this guy went to, you know. Then I was like, oh, there's <laughs> Chicago comics history. <laughs> Tell me, because like I only had read manga really before that, you know, and like Kate Beaton's Tumblr comics. Um, so. Uh, Jeffrey was great, and then we took his class together. It was a great time. But um, I, the the comic that I read when I was like 20 years old that like blew my mind was Big Kids by Michael DeForge, um, and I I was like a big Adventure Time fan. Um, but that was one of the first. This was like probably uh, a little like a little bit after me in me and Gabe's conversation where he was like, you should read good comics. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, he was like, you have to read something besides Scott Pilgrim. And it was a whole, it was a whole thing, but um, I like Scott Pilgrim. Um, and he, he, di he did not at the time. But, um, but yeah, Big Kids was just such, it's such a great book. I, I still really enjoy it, and then I, I love Michael's other work too. Um, the Luz anthology series was a huge inspiration for Pee Pee Poo Poo. Um, yeah. Awesome. I also read a lot of Jeffrey Brown, like in high school, um, and I think he, well, Gabrielle Bell is the person that I cite the most, and I think it is that thing of like I read it and I was like, oh, you can write about like nothing happening, and it's like I just want to keep reading, and I was like, oh, I can write about just my life. I'm like, I want to read about this like early twenties person just like trying to find an apartment in New York. Like, it's just you know, it sounds like the driest thing, but it's like so much about you know her internal life and these little tiny dramas, and and also I mean her cartooning is is beautiful, but similar to Jeffrey, I feel like you can look at it and you can be like, oh yeah, like a human person drew that. I'm a human person. I can draw a little bit. Like, maybe I can make a comic. So there's like a lot of comics that I think that I was reading, but some of the ones where it was like, it, the veil was like thin, you know? And you're like, okay, yeah, I see a future or something. Yeah. Uh, for me, I, I grew up during one of the manga booms, manga booms, oh my god. <laughs> Lord forgive me. <laughs> no, that, that, that just indicated that yeah, yeah, it was an early, it was in, the, a, in the manga era when we said that. Manga era. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like, so my dad only 
really was only really interested in superhero comics, and I never related to them because I'm just a girl. Uh, <laughs> so I I was like, okay, like drawing is something cool and fun, and then. I started seeing manga pop up on bookshelves, and I saw, I remember when I was really young, my dad realized that I liked manga, and he got me Uzumaki. Because <laughs> he was like, I like horror, you like manga, this is like us. <laughs> and I was like, wow, comics really can be anything. This is about, <laughs> this is about a town haunted by spirals. Uh, <laughs> comics can be whatever you want them to be. It was just, and that, and then like, uh, I was on Tumblr in my teens, and there was just a huge, like, amount of people, like teenagers, doing like autobio comics, and that was really exciting for me too. And there, it, none of these things like really show up in, as influences in my work because I don't do autobio and I don't do uzumaki, but, <laughs> but like just knowing and seeing the scope of what comics could be when I was a teen was really, really exciting. So here's this is something that Josh touched on a little bit. Um, I was thinking like, all right, so you had a magic wish, right? Maybe or I don't know. Maybe it's an aspirational thing, and it's just like um, you think about some other artist, and it's just like if only I could blank as well as that person, right? Or if I I don't know draw word balloons like. Not like Winter McKay because he did them terribly, but but mm. but but somebody, right? Like, it, 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 you know, this may be a completely stupid question, but I'm just curious. Justin Green, yeah. What part of Justin Green? Um, might be like, I don't know, like those fleshy faces he does. I like the way that he does, like, no ego. He's just trying to, he's part of that school who just wants his stuff to look like industrial illustration. And then it somehow is just in, 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 infused with all this energy. And it's perfect surrealism because it's such, he creates such a, uh, a veneer of that kind of old illustration where he's trying to pay attention to the craft. So when he creates, like, magical realism content, it's so, it's so powerful because he has that voice of that kind of that we trust as part of that feels like conventional, uh, yeah, establishment illustration. Yeah, I, I would just throw out there that he wasn't, he couldn't help paying attention to the craft. He couldn't help because his OCD was so severe that he couldn't stop. You know, he was demonized by by, by those by, by those things. But it's he produced amazing stuff. He's, you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. We uh, maybe that's the question. Like, what do you? You're obsessed to do this one thing. What do you wish you were obsessed to do? Oh. Or the other question, another way of looking at this is like, if you think of your own work, right? Is there some thing that you do that you wish you could maybe do a little bit better? Or like, do you get away with like some people have struggled drawing hands. Some people don't. You know, like, not everybody draws cars, but a lot of people don't like drawing cars or or colors on shirts or like whatever it is. There might be like some quirky little thing that you use shortcuts or shorthand to get around doing. Um, and maybe one day you'll get really good at it or maybe not. Maybe you'll just continue not having to do it. Mm. But I don't know if there, if there is something out there that you can think of. I feel like this is sort of a total style thing, but like Tayo Matsumoto, like He's able to draw in a style that is both rough and like just conveys the whole world and the, the blacks and the contrast is like so perfectly balanced and like uh, it just looks both effortful and effortless and I, I, yeah, like I wish I could do that vibe. <laughs> Stuff is so good. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. I love Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> we all just okay. Next. Next. Yeah. I did have a funny thought. I mean, yeah. the first thing that came to mind was not a stylistic thing because I do think style. So much of the way I draw comes out of some of these things of like, uh, I don't really want to draw a car. Okay, I'm gonna like make up a way that cars look, mm -hmm. you know, in my hand. And but I think like there is something about content where I do have this desire where I'm like, I work 
well, so like like somebody like Alison Bechtel, who like consistently reveals these like parts of herself to the world, and you know sometimes I do that, and other times I'm like ah, I'm like I don't have the courage to do this, but I wish that I could consistently just like be revealing <laughs> in a way that I think like or like vulnerable in my work. Mm -hmm. That's something I would like. Right. Yeah, for me, I've uh, I. I definitely, every couple years, I go through this phase where I really want to draw horror comics, mm. which is really silly for the way I draw. Uh, <laughs> so, like, I drew Hellphone because it was like, oh, it's kind of horror, but it's cute. Uh, but sometimes I go really dense with line, and, like, I never show people those comics, or I bury them on my website. Uh, so I'm like, hopefully people see this one day. But uh, I, I just, one thing I really like is, like, really lived in spaces, like, a room where there's like trash in the corner, and I just I love that, uh, and that's something I want to get better at. It's like making spaces look like people exist in them. Yeah, I've been trying to do that more too, because I feel like the more interesting you can make a background to draw, like the more you want to draw it. Yeah, <laughs> there's also just like how much you can tell about a character based on the room they live in. Like, I think that's really interesting. Totally. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, one of you was, you're, you're both, you know, a bunch of you were, were. So some of you went to art school, some of you didn't. You know, some people go to art school, some people don't. Some people learn um, in, di in different ways, um, and it doesn't really matter um, how you get to where you're where you're at. But it, it could be art school, it could be anywhere. But like, can you? I'm, I'm thinking of like a conversation with Dan Klaus once, where he was talking about the one thing he learned at Pratt. And he, you know, wrote a story called Art School Confidential. And, and Carolyn, you did the, your own take on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was a movie too, right? But like he, was, he said, the one thing he, the one thing that he actually learned in art school was how to, um, um, how to letter, right? And if nothing else, it was worth it to, to learn how to letter. And it's we're all the better for that teacher who taught him had a letter in a way, maybe, you know, if you're, if you're a fan of his, but can you guys think of something that you learned from somebody that um, really you're grateful for? Jess you're yeah, Jessica Campbell taught me how the, the like, um, the magic wand tool works in Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> and it changed my life. <laughs> That um, that kind of that kind of like uh, mentality of like really valuing the things you get from like an industrial illustration background, it reminds me of like how Sammy Harcum used to say that he wished he had gone, he had gone to the Joe Kubert school, and uh, yeah, definitely. I think we all have that moment where you're like, I you know, I wish I had these these old you know, this old style of discipline and it's old chops and it's part, it was part of this older tradition and that my stuff looked like that much more accessible. But uh, yeah, can Sammy Harcum going to Joe Kubert school, what is that, like what would they possibly have given him that he, you know, didn't provide on his own? Right. But as I said when I was answering your first question, I have a major sense of FOMO when I'm working. I always want to work in somebody else's style. Okay. Well, so this is a question I was going to ask to everybody, but but it's I think I know the answer for you, Josh. But it's just like, um, and we, and we got to open up for some questions in a second. But like, how much do you stick to a formula? Like, how strict are you about like plotting out your stories, or and how spontaneous are you on? It, you make it up as you're drawing, right? Is it a combination of the both, or do you have like one particular thing that you really are rigid about standing with? Um, well, with my stuff, it's mostly gags, so it's just set up punchline. Yeah. Uh, but for uh, in most of my books, uh, in Hellphone, that's a whole story that I just improvised day to day as I was doing it. So it doesn't have an ending. Okay. But I, I I can't work on something with a plan. <laughs> it's it's basically lost on paper. Uh, 
but um, yeah, I, I, I'm definitely more spontaneous, spont, 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 yes, that's the word, <laughs> spontaneous, yeah. yes. That's so cool. <laughs> I, I, you can really feel it in your work too, because the characters, like, they, they're writing their own narratives, like they have, yeah. yeah when I, I draw, it feels like I'm like playing with toys and I'm just like <laughs> positioning them around playing house. Totally. Yeah. It's awesome. I don't know. And like it makes the gags so funny because they feel so or organic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it does drive editors crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, it's, if you go back to Bushmiller, though, it's just what he did. It's just like everything, like I, with your pages and grill juice, it's like yeah, every page is a gag, mm -hmm. right? You know, and it's, it's not easy to pull that off if you're doing multiple pages. It's really hard to be that funny consistently. So I applaud you for that. It's not consistent. Uh. <laughs> you are giving it a shot. At least I'm trying, you know, that's yes. what matters. In, in Girl Juice, for um, the, like the longer story at the end, did you write that one out ahead of time or did no, you No, absolutely just, yeah, not. Okay, cool. no. yeah. I was like, I had like a rough idea of what I wanted and then when I got uh, like halfway through, I was like, I don't know how this is gonna end. And then I spent like a week just trying to figure out how to end it. And it, I think it worked out. I don't know. It worked out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I planned some stuff out ahead of time. I, the more I plan ahead of time, the better it usually ends up being. So I, I try and plan stuff out. Um, I kind of like thumbnail out. I, I plan how the panels are going to look first on the okay. page. Um, and then I figure out what I want to go in them, <laughs> which is kind of like a backwards way of doing it, but I, I, I don't know, it works for me. Because um, if I make the layout really interesting to me, then it's more compelling for me to finish it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know, I know you're a planner. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I work straight into a grid, but I also don't, you know, my I kind of change the paneling after the fact if I'm like, oh, this beat needs to be longer or something. But, mm -hmm. but as far as like a long like longer things go, I typically thumbnail the whole thing, and I I'm not really a big script person. Like I do scripts if I'm doing nonfiction, and I have to like send it to an editor mm -hmm. in that format beforehand. But I find everything gets like so much wordier than I want it to be, so I thumbnail like a whole story and usually, or like my earliest book was kind of like, I was thinking in like spreads. So I would just like do a spread and like do a scene and a scene and a scene and then kind of at the end take them all and like reorganize them. And the same thing with like doing a long thing. I tend to like, with the contradictions, like thumbnail the whole thing and then edit down from there, which I, I feel like every time I start a project, I kind of forget that I have to do that. And I like try to make these plans in this other way, or I try to outline, but actually like making the comics like finds the thing itself and then taking it and going, okay, I have to edit and change this from having like dredged up the clay and then being like, okay, like yeah. what do we got? Yeah. Um, let's see if my process, one thing that was really liberating for me in terms of like getting my stories down was um, people telling me that you don't need to thumbnail that um, you know that that completely, and uh, that Tom Hart when I was at SVA said you know you can do stick fi he said you can do stick figures with an arrow with the name pointing to them, and uh, yeah I I know some people need to work like with really fleshed out fleshed out pencil, fleshed out preliminaries. But uh, one, thing, one thing that's really cool about going to festivals like this is and just kind of reaching out of your little cocoon because we're all pretty, you know, we're all pretty like studio-based and inhibited, and not inhibited, but um, introverted. And um, the, it's so good talking to other people and like they can help you cover so much more ground than you possibly could on your own. So I was talking to another teacher uh, this summer, and they were saying, it turns out they had gotten a PhD in writing. And I said, well, what's that like? And they said, well, I did my thesis reading all of the books on writing that writers write. And I said, well, what's the consensus? And she goes, really? It's, everybody comes down to it's a very DIY process. So a lot of the process of reading a million how to write books was sort of de 
demystifying the process. So uh, I've heard people, you know, really, you know, Herzog, when he talks about his process, when, um, uh, you know, um, recently disgraced writer Neil Gaiman said that he, uh, liter he'll, not literally, but he'll throw whatever he, ideas he has against the wall, and he's like, whatever is left, whatever mud's left sticking on the wall, I build off of that. And all that's really encouraging. I feel like I get so mixed up working. It's like I feel like less confused than, than ever, like the more I hear how simple people's processes are and how it just comes down to trying raw creativity and figuring out a new process every time you do a project. Sure. All right, I think um, we're getting down there. So um, do people have questions? I think somebody's supposed to come and... Okay. Oh, there's Down here, if you're if you got a question, if you just please move to the. I don't know. Hey. Okay. Now we can. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, hi. <laughs> I mean, I, I love self-publishing, it's so fun. Um, I, I got set up with Sprocket because I was self-publishing and I would always just give them whatever I was working on and they would, it was, it was back before they, they were where they are now, but they would give me like a copy of like Benji's book or like Ben Passmore's book, like whatever like the new book comic that I really wanted was, we would just trade zines and it was great and then after doing that for a few years, they chalked me and said that they wanted to mm. publish me, and I, I didn't take them seriously for eight months, and then I was because I thought they were just being nice. But, mm. um, but yeah, I I really think that just being consistent is the best way to go about anything. Um, but especially with self-publishing, I I think making sure that you're printing something that you are happy with and that you are printing as cheaply as you can. <laughs> and you are consistently doing that. It goes a long way, you know? But you, I really, really recommend printing as cheaply as possible. <laughs> you know, I think five, a $5 zine is the best thing in the world to make, but. <laughs> yeah, I also made a lot of $5 zines. Um, I, so with Uncivilized was the, my first like bigger publisher that I worked with, and I I self published before that. Um, I was a part of this collective in Montreal and uh, called, called Coloss, and so like we were we had this label that would go on the books that said it was a Coloss book, but like actually we were all paying to print our own books and just kind of like a part of this crew. But like by association, we got put, you know, they would put us on like the main floor at TCAF because it was like a bunch of cartoonists work. So I, I, I always encourage my students to like start collectives because people will take you more seriously for like no reason. I mean, just mm -hmm. you kind of have a scene and like people will be like, oh, this is like a vibe. Mm -hmm. But, but um, my first stuff that I was giving to Tom Kaczynski at Uncivilized, I did, I had been working at a comic book store and I was the small press buyer. So I had like exchanged a couple of emails with him to buy uncivilized comics but like I just you know gave him comics at shows and I was I didn't have any expectations but it's like if you're a fan of these smaller publishers and you're giving them work like um, yeah like he just eventually was like do you want to do a book so and I, th I think publishers when you're making work consistently and they're seeing you and they're seeing that you can sell it and they're like, oh, we could sell this too, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and yeah. And going to the festivals, you don't know who, Silver Sprocket wasn't around like seven years ago. Um, is that right? Is that the right time length? I think they were they around. Were. They were just much smaller. Much smaller. So somebody who's like a, you know, a tiny micro publisher now 
you know, they're the people who notice you. And, you know, the bigger they get, the bigger, the more crowded it is, and then the better it is to find, like, a new person. Um, the, uh, yeah, the book I did before Unended, uh, I took it around to publishers, and I felt lucky to get on Tinto Press. But I told him, I, he was like, you can shop it around and try to get it on a different one that you want. And um, Andy Koyama was like, I'm sorry, I'm going out of business, goodbye. And um, Secret Acres, uh, like, basically had no interest in me. And Top Shelf had no interest in me. And Fanta had no interest in me. And Uncivilized also wasn't, didn't put it out. And so I, but I kept in contact with Tom. And I always kind of hope that I get on, Uncivilized as one of my dream publishers. And I hope that I'd be that accepted, but didn't take that for granted. Uh, and I was like, uh, so when he finally, I kept on pushing, I kept on emailing without being too pushy, hopefully. And uh, the connections I've made at these festivals have been like super essential. Yeah, uh, for me also, I started self-publishing uh, when I was pretty young and was picked up by Silver Sprocket when they were really small. So yeah, definitely like, don't discount small publishers at all because they could blow up later <laughs> and do really well. But also, like, get in where you fit in. Like, because uh, not every publisher is gonna be a good fit for you. Uh, so I've 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 been watching people today give their comics to people, being like, "Will you publish this?" And it's like a completely different genre than anything they do, and it's just like, no, they're probably not gonna publish that. But it's also kind of. To like consider to be faux pas to ask somebody to publish you at the festivals. I've done that mistake, but I heard later, I think in an interview, maybe with maybe with Avi from Silver Sprocket, they, like you say hi and you introduce yourself and you say uh, I like your work and I do this kind of work. But um, then you email them later and ask them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we're out of time. And, um, oh, sorry, one more thing. So um, uh, I teach at SVA, and they asked me to uh, promote the fact that there's an SVA um, um, portfolio review um, um, showcase thing happening. Showcase? So that is happening now until 3, and it's also happening tomorrow till 3. Um, and people are interested in having them give their opinions on your work. Feel free to talk to them. Also, Benji and I are going to be signing at the Drawn and Quarterly booth uh, directly after this for the next hour. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll be signing at the Sprocket booth, I think, at 3. We're all doing stuff. Yay! <laughs> Thank you.